it's one thing to be able to take a vinegar reaction and combine the reagents and predict the product. But a very common task we have is looking at a product and thinking, what is the best way to make a, a product through a Wittig reaction? So now we're going to look at doing a retrosynthesis with the Wittig. How can we see a product and say, ah, that compound can be made through a Wittig. Not only can it be made through a Wittig, but here's exactly how you would do it. So let's make this a really simple alkene. We want to make this with a Wittig. And we know that a Wittig reaction forms this carbon-carbon double bond. So let's try to work this backwards. For any alkene, we can imagine two different ways to do the Wittig reaction and make it. So let's look at those two different pathways for this molecule and decide if one is better than the other. So here's our starting material. Retrosynthetically, and that's a retrosynthesis error. We're envisioning this reaction going backwards and splitting it into its parts we could see that maybe maybe the left side came from the carbonyl compound being attacked. So that would start with a ketone, and that's fine. That's a completely valid starting material. And the other, the two carbons on the right, maybe those came from our illid. And, you know, I've drawn it neutral. You can also draw it with charges. It's just fine. So we could combine those two reagents. They would combine and make our alkene. Okay, that looks totally reasonable. Um, so that's a completely valid starting material as, an, as a ketone. But now we, we have to make our illid. How do we make our illid? Well, we treat our uh, phosphonium salt. That would be our phosphonium salt with a strong base. And for this particular one, we need something like butyllithium. Okay, that, that all looks reasonable. And if we keep going backwards, we, uh, how would we make this phosphonium salt? We treat five, triphenylphosphine with bromoethane. And that would, these two reagents would make our phosphonium salt. Okay, so that, that looks okay. Uh, let's look at the other way to do this. Run this backwards. Remember, we're trying to break this. So now in this case, let's take the right-hand side and make the right-hand side be the carbonyl. And the left-hand side come from the uh, phosphonium illid. So here is our phosphorus reagent. And that would react with this aldehyde, those two would combine to make our product on the left. Um, this aldehyde is a totally valid starter material, so let's keep working from our phosphonium. How would we make this uh, illid? Well, we'd make this illid by treating the corresponding phosphonium salt. Let's assume it's a bromide plus a strong base, and this would have to be butyl lithium. Okay, no problem. Now, how would we make this phosphonium salt? Well, we take this uh, two bromoprotein and we treat it with triphenylphosphine. And that looks pretty reasonable. However, if you notice, at the top sequence, we use a primary halide for this SN2 reaction. In the bottom reaction, we have to rely on using a secondary halide for our SN2 reaction. Triphenylphosphine is not a great nucleophile for SN2 halides. I don't want to say it can't happen, but in practice, you don't see it very much. <clears throat> Therefore, the top pathway is our preferred pathway. So anytime we do look at a, a Wittig reaction, and we want to use a Wittig reaction to make an alkene, there are two different ways we can accomplish that. Typically, one pathway will be a little bit better, better than the other, and oftentimes it comes down to the degree of substitution of the halide that you need to make your phosphonium salt.